Hello and thank you for watching part 5 of this series in which we will look at the two remaining resurrection events, the differences between them and where they are positioned on the timeline. We will also bring into account the information regarding the temple and harvest models that we have considered thus far and how they allow us to construct a timeline that does not contradict the word of God. If this is the first video in the series that you have watched, please stop the video now and start with part 1 which is linked in the description below. The previous installments will assist in providing the necessary background required to understand what will be discussed today. We have now considered several models and patterns provided to us in the Word of God and shown how these allow us to correctly understand what is meant with the first resurrection mentioned in Revelation 20. We have also considered the attributes that apply to people belonging to the remainder of the first harvest and how the properties of the barley harvest differ from the wheat harvest. Today's video will be a little longer as we have quite a lot of information to cover. But I pray that this will be a blessing to you in receiving proper understanding of what is written in the Word of God. Also, I am not claiming to have 100% understanding as I am fallible but I do my best to derive an understanding that avoids contradiction with the Word of God. All I am offering to you is what I see, and I invite you to point out any issues in which you can see a clear contradiction between what I say and what is written in the Word of God. So let us see what the Word of God has to say about the two remaining resurrection events of the first resurrection, or the barley harvest, and what we can learn from what is written. Paul describes a resurrection event in two of his epistles involving people who had faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, in which several other attributes and bits of information are also conveyed to the reader. These aspects are very important to note, as John, in the book of Revelation, describes another resurrection event of people who had faith in Jesus that are very different attributes to those described to us by Paul. Let us first look at what Paul writes. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul describes a resurrection event involving a specific group of people to which the following important attributes apply. People who belong to this group include some who are dead and those who are alive at the time when this event occurs. This event would seem to occur when people are going about their lives as we are doing today. There is nothing unusual mentioned about the condition on earth when this happens. Paul does not list any requirements regarding the manner of death applied to those members of this group who had already died and who will be raised from the dead, pointing us to the fact that this resurrection can include all who have died in Christ since Jesus' resurrection up to this point in time where this event occurs without contradicting the word of God. This also points to and represents the attributes of the main harvest event. It is a sudden, unexpected event. Those who are part of this group are immediately with the Lord when it happens. The meeting takes place in the air. Members of this group remain with the Lord from this point forward. Paul also tells us what specific qualities these people will have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 which is once again having faith in Jesus as the Son of God, the primary defining attribute of the barley harvest as previously discussed. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
Another resurrection event is described to us by John in the book of Revelation. And we have to compare what was written by John to what was written by Paul to compare what is said by both writers and discover the differences. Many people overlook the differences between what Paul describes and what John describes. And this once again leads to much contention and incorrect understanding of the word of God. Let us pay careful attention to these differences. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and a judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. John tells us about people who are resurrected and who are positioned on thrones with Jesus, just as we have seen in the case of the twenty-four elders that John mentioned in Revelation 4. And these also reign with Jesus a thousand years. There are very specific qualities mentioned in these two verses that are unique to this group of people, and these are that they were all beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and that they did not worship the beast or took his mark in their bodies. This is very important to keep in mind when comparing with Paul's description. The reader is also told that those who form part of the first resurrection are blessed and holy, which implies that this group forms part of the first resurrection, but that they mark the conclusion of this harvest, given that John states, this is the first resurrection. We could also have said this is the faith harvest or this is the barley harvest and this group would therefore match the description of the gleanings of the first resurrection and represent the outer court of God's temple. How did this group that John saw get to their resurrection and how does this differ from what Paul described? We see this explained to us in Revelation 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. From this information, the following differences between Paul and John's accounts can be pointed out. John's group does not allow for people who are alive to be part of it, as those who were beheaded for their faith in Jesus had to wait for those who should be killed as they were. So no person who remains alive can become part of this group according to God's word after the main harvest has occurred, if we are strict in keeping to what the word of God says. However, this fact is also confirmed for us in Leviticus 27, where we are told that those who are holy to the Lord, being sanctified by the first fruits of the harvest, and who cannot be redeemed by the owner of the field a second time, since they are already holy, have to be put to death. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Those that belong to this group are then shown to all suffer beheading for their faith in Jesus and for refusing to worship the beast and for refusing his mark in their bodies. This confirms then that those who are mentioned by John as being resurrected are all part of the gleanings of God's harvest of faith and that they become the outer court of the temple over a period of 42 months, which John was told not to measure. John clearly describes the method of death by which these people are all killed and the reason for their deaths. 
In Paul's case, a completely different scenario is depicted. John's group is not immediately with the Lord as in Paul's case, and they have to wait for some time after they are beheaded for their resurrection event to occur. Only when the full number of people who are all beheaded are assembled under the altar of God are they resurrected. This is also very different to what Paul describes. Those who are beheaded for their faith in Jesus, harvested by the poor and not the owner of the field, gather under the altar of God positioned in the outer court of the temple, where they cry out to God. In Paul's description, those who are resurrected are all changed into glorified beings in the twinkling of an eye, and include people who are alive at the time. They meet the Lord in the air and do not have to wait for anything after this, as they will be with the Lord from that point onwards. The final resurrection is not a sudden event that happens unexpectedly. It is an event that requires those who are part of this resurrection group to wait for the last person who would lay down their life for having faith in Jesus and to be beheaded. Those who are waiting under the altar also cry out to Jesus to avenge their deaths. This is also very different to what Paul describes. John would seem to be describing a resurrection that would occur after the start of the tribulation, while Paul's resurrection would seem to occur before the tribulation commenced. When we compare the attributes of the resurrection events as described by Paul and by John, can we really conclude that they are describing a single event, or the same event? There are many believers who overlook the fact that the first resurrection is a three-part harvest, and they believe that there remains only a single resurrection event, resulting in arguments about where this would be positioned on the timeline. Instead, without realizing that we have to apply the harvest model to the remainder of God's harvest of faith, also known as the first resurrection or the barley harvest, we will never be able to get to the truth. Paul's description of a resurrection event matches the attributes of the main harvest, while John's description lines up with the gleanings of the harvest. Do we find any additional information in the word regarding the resurrection of those who were beheaded and the timing of their resurrection event? I believe the actual resurrection event that represents the gleanings of the faith harvest is described to us in the following passage. And after three days and an half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You will remember that the wise virgins told the foolish virgins to go and buy oil from those who sell, as we see in the following passage. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. Who are those that sell the oil to the foolish virgins, according to God's word? Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me, and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The two witnesses are given power to destroy their enemies, or any that would hurt them, while they are emptying the golden oil out of them, and giving it to those who did not have oil in their lamps when the bridegroom returned. This passage in Zechariah is clearly linked to the following passage in Revelation, where the two witnesses' ministry is linked to the formation of the outer court. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. 
and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. The two witnesses' ministry coincides with the period assigned to the formation of the outer court, and they are given power to destroy those who would harm them, while they are testifying and handing out oil to those whose lamps have gone out. This will continue for a period of 1,260 days, or 42 months. Why would the two witnesses allow themselves to be killed then, given that they are given the power to kill those who would come against them to harm them? And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. When we combine all of this information, it is logical to deduct that the two witnesses will lay down their lives willingly once the outer court has reached completion, or once the final Gentile who refuses to accept the mark of the beast has been beheaded. We see this pattern repeating in Jesus' case, where we read the following in Matthew 26. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? And that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. Jesus was in the same situation, having legions of angels available to him that could have defended him against those who wanted to crucify him, and having the ability to simply speak the words in order to avoid being put to death. But he allowed those who hated him to kill him, so that any person who would put their trust in him could receive salvation and everlasting life. In the same way, the two witnesses lay their lives down when they have nobody left to testify to, or looked at this from the perspective of the patterns and models that we've considered thus far, when those who are called the poor, pointing to Satan and his followers, have completed gleaning the remainder of God's harvest of faith, and when the final number of souls who are beheaded for their faith have assembled under the altar of God, and when the outer court of God's temple has reached completion after 42 months, only then will the final resurrection occur. This point would also mark the fullness of the Gentiles, where the barley field would be found completely empty, and the temple of God in heaven, consisting of three parts, will be complete. Who would then remain on earth after this point? The word shows us that there would be two groups remaining on the earth at this point. The first is those who follow after Satan and the Antichrist and who have the mark of the beast in their bodies and who would be responsible for the deaths of those who were beheaded. The second will be the remnant of Israel who would be fleeing into the wilderness at this point, who would not be part of the covenant that the Antichrist will make with many which points to a specific covenant with the Gentile nations only, as seen in this passage. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We also know that when the barley harvest's gleaning start, that Satan, at this point, would have no authority over the corners of the wheat harvest, as the first fruits of this harvest is only presented to the Lord at the point where the gleanings of the barley harvest completes, and Satan would therefore not be allowed to do with the wheat harvest as he is doing with the barley harvest. So let us begin to construct a timeline in which we can position the events that we have considered in such a way that we avoid contradicting various passages in the Word of God that we have to consider as we do this. To start off with, we know that the first fruits of the barley harvest, which include people all the way back to Abel, 
who is the first person to have confessed his faith in Jesus, were resurrected when Jesus and the twenty-four elders were presented before the throne of God and completed the most holy part of the temple of God. John describes the twenty-four elders positioned on thrones around the throne of God when he was given the revelation of Jesus and they also took part in the conversations with John asking him questions and providing answers and were not seen here by Isaiah and Ezekiel who also visited the throne room of God. The remainder of this harvest has been given almost 2,000 years to ripen and currently contains foolish and wise virgins and good and evil servants that will be separated as soon as the next resurrection event occurs. We have been given many heavenly signs on God's timepiece above our heads, showing us that the next harvest event, which Paul describes, representing the main barley harvest or main faith harvest, is just about to occur. From Jesus' resurrection all the way to a point in time where this resurrection event occurs, we have a dispensation during which very specific attributes apply to those who live in it. Jesus gave authority over the kingdom of Satan to those who would believe in him during this period, as seen in Matthew 16 verse 18 to 19, and allowed people to receive everlasting life by placing their faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The same authority represented by keys that can lock and unlock is shown to be given to one of the churches who are exercising their authority over Satan and his kingdom and who are shining their lights in the world as wise virgins and good servants, as we can see in this passage. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. These are the qualities of those who have the indwelling Spirit of God living in them, which allows them to restrain Satan and his kingdom. This church also is given no reprimand and promise to be kept from the hour of temptation that will be coming over the world, because they kept the word of his patience. But what does this mean? We read the following in James. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. For many years believers have been watching for the return of the Lord, but many have been offended by those who expected Him to return at various points throughout history, with nothing happening when the prospective dates finally arrived. Many would seem to no longer care to watch for His return and would seem to find the disappointment that is associated with a non-event unbearable. Many who have given up would also often lash out at those who remain steadfast in their patience, as they continue to watch and not deviate from their determination to continue to watch for the Lord's return, even if it does not happen in their lifetimes. This passage in James tells us that we have to remain patient, because our Lord will wait until the very last moment before He returns, to ensure that the holy place of His temple 
will have the perfect number of saints forming part of the construction. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we see Paul mentioning the restrainer and how the restrainer relates to the Antichrist also known as the son of perdition or the wicked. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Paul points us to the presence of the Church of Philadelphia, the church who was given the keys to lock and to unlock, and against which the gates of hell are unable to prevail. And these are steadfast in watching for the return of the Lord, and do not deny His name before the world. But they shine their lights for Him in the world, which is full of darkness. They have oil in their lamps, and are earning additional talents from those that they have received from their Master. Having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they exercise authority over Satan and his kingdom, actively preventing Satan from putting forth his Antichrist until they are all removed. This passage also shows us a clear condition imposed on the appearance of the wicked, which is once again understood when referencing the harvest model. The main harvest restrains the poor from starting the gleaning process. If the poor began to glean before the owner of the field harvested the main harvest of the crop, it would be considered theft. Once the main harvest had been reaped, however, the poor basically owns what remains of the crop and has free reign over it, and can glean the field as they desire. The owner is then not allowed to interfere according to the word of God. The same is true for the first resurrection. Satan is restrained from acting while the main harvest remains in the field and requires the owner to reap the main harvest before he can enter the field to begin the gleaning process. We see this shift in dispensation clearly depicted in Revelation 13. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Note how this passage clearly identifies the Gentiles being present on earth when the gleaning process commences, and they are also the focus of Satan's attention. In one of the kingdom parables we encounter a person who was found present at the wedding without the proper wedding attire, and this person, just as the foolish virgins and the evil servants, is also cast out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we know that the evil servants and the foolish virgins are not allowed into the wedding with the bridegroom when he arrives, and are found outside when the door is closed. So who could this person be, and how did he gain entry? The Word of God shows us that there is one person who has access to the throne of God who is not clothed in a wedding garment. This is Satan. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan currently has access to the throne room of God, and accuses the world before him. There will come a time when Satan will be bound and cast out, never allowed access to heaven again and restrained within the confines of the earth. The timing of this event also lines up with what we read earlier in this chapter, and is clearly connected to the restrainer being removed from the earth. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven.
and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So in Paul's resurrection, representing the main section of the faith harvest, occurs, Satan is cast down to the earth, no longer having access to heaven, and he then begins the gleaning process, knowing that he has 42 months remaining. Given that the outer court of God's temple requires 42 months to be trodden underfoot, and representing the gleanings of the first resurrection that is given over into the hand of Satan. In Daniel we are given more information about the period that follows when the wicked is revealed after the restrainer is removed. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. In Daniel 9, one week representing a seven-year period is described during which a covenant with many, or with the Gentile nation specifically, is made. We are dealing with the gleanings of the barley harvest when this period starts, and as such, Satan has received specific authority over the gleanings according to the instructions given to us in the Word of God relating to the harvests. The nation of Israel, belonging to a different harvest corporately, has other conditions imposed on them and would seem not to be included in the covenant that is made at the beginning of this week, and considering that there will remain people from Israel with pure DNA alive on the earth when the two witnesses are murdered. This is the only understanding that does not lead to a contradiction with the word of God and where the remnant of Israel would be preserved and be allowed to enter the millennial reign of their Messiah, while no pure Gentile will remain on earth after the barley harvest is gleaned. At this point it is not exactly clear when the gleaning process starts, and many often teach that there would be a false peace on the earth for the first half of this seven year period and that the real trouble will only start in the second half. Is that really true? There are several events mentioned in the Bible that are associated with a three and a half year period, but it is often not easy to know how to correctly assign them to the first or second half of the tribulation. It is very important to understand what happens at the midpoint of the tribulation and to link what we know with other passages in the word in order to position events correctly. Let us shift our focus to the nation of Israel for a better understanding. The word of God shows us in relation to the nation of Israel, and in this passage from Daniel specifically, that the sacrifices and oblations will be ended at the midpoint of the week. This statement would have us understand that the third temple would exist in the first half of this week, and that animal sacrifices would have resumed in the first half of this week as well. It would therefore not make sense to believe that the temple will only be completed in the second half, as that would mean that sacrifices and oblations would cease before the third temple is ready. We further know that the word shows us that Israel will be protected in the wilderness for 1260 days, and that they will only flee into the wilderness when they see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When we combine this passage with Daniel 9, we can see that Israel will be performing sacrifices and oblations as part of the third temple service in the first half of this week, and will enter their protection in the wilderness at the midpoint of the week, when the sacrifices and oblations are ceased, and will then be protected for the duration of the second half. The word also tells us that Israel will only recognize their Messiah after they have been afflicted, and two-thirds of the nation have been killed. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined. 
and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. During the Second World War, one-third of the Jewish nation was wiped out. But since then, no other atrocity of that magnitude has occurred again. And this is therefore a yet future prophecy to be fulfilled. Our Heavenly Father also explains the following. I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Israel is promised a period of affliction, also referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is brought over them in order to get them to acknowledge their offense, which is the rejection of their Messiah. Only when they recognize their error and after two-thirds of the nation have been wiped out, will Israel seek the Lord and will He reveal Himself to them and allow them to see Him with their eyes, since they are a nation without any faith, and then enter His protection in the wilderness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely, with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that trespass against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel." and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Here we also have to remember that the word of God tells us that Israel has a curse over them because they rejected their Messiah. Jesus pronounced this curse over Israel when he revealed himself to them the first time. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Paul affirms this by sharing a little more information regarding the time at which this curse would be lifted. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. By now it should be clear that the fullness of the Gentiles represents the completion of the first resurrection, which is a specific condition imposed on Israel requiring the field in which the barley harvest grew to be completely empty and with nobody left on earth who could still be saved through faith in Jesus. Once this has happened, it would imply that God's heavenly temple would consist of three completed sections, each having people who are clothed in white, sitting on thrones with crowns ruling with Him. We have to fit this understanding and timing with our understanding of Israel's situation. Israel will not be able to recognize who their Messiah is until the first resurrection is complete, or the fullness of the Gentiles had been achieved. Before this happens, two-thirds of the nation will be slain, according to Zechariah 13. This time is also known as Jacob's trouble, that will bring about the affliction pointed out in Hosea 5. This will cause Israel to seek their Messiah, and 42 months 
After the start of the tribulation, it would be the first time in the world's history at which a point is reached where the fullness of the Gentiles would be possible. This means that the Gentile nations existing in mortal bodies with God's image in their DNA will come to an end, leaving only the remnant of Israel and those with the mark of the beast or having DNA with the image of Satan who follow after the beast on the earth. This end that will be made to the Gentile nations is confirmed for us in Jeremiah 30, which is also where we read about Jacob's trouble. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. As soon as the two witnesses are killed, who would have emptied the golden oil out of themselves, giving it to those who did not have oil, or the gleanings of the faith harvest, the conditions that would allow Israel's blindness to be removed would have been reached. This would once again mark a new dispensation, and this starts off for the remnant of Israel entering their protection in the wilderness. The only logical point at which Israel's blindness therefore can be removed would be at the midpoint of the week. If we position the removal of their blindness at the start of the tribulation, there would be no time for Israel to experience any affliction, as mentioned in the previous passages. The fullness of the Gentiles would then also not follow the model of the harvest, and in Revelation 11 it is clearly stated that the gleanings will require 42 months to be trampled underfoot. If we position Israel's blindness being removed at the end of the tribulation, Israel's protection in the wilderness for 1260 days, as we read in Revelation 12, would become redundant and would serve no purpose. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Remember also that those who are in Judea, in other words Israel, are instructed to flee into the wilderness when they see the abomination of desolation in the temple of God. The only position on this timeline where Israel's blindness could then be removed without contradicting the word would be at the midpoint of the tribulation or in the middle of the week as explained to Daniel. The seven year period will therefore start with Israel entering into Jacob's trouble where this nation will experience affliction as they have never experienced before, keeping in mind that the second seal that is opened in the book of Revelation also states that peace will be taken from the earth as soon as the restrainer is removed and the Antichrist is revealed. There would therefore not be a time of false peace for the first three and a half years. At the midpoint, a small remnant of Israel will remain, who will still have God's image in their DNA, and they will flee into the wilderness when they see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple of God, and will enter their protection in the wilderness where they will be kept safe for the duration of the second half of this week. What else are we shown regarding the midpoint of the tribulation? We know that those of the Gentile nations who are beheaded for having the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God gather under the altar of God and they cry out to the Lord to avenge their blood on those who dwell on the earth. In other words, those with the mark of the beast following after the Antichrist are responsible for the deaths of those who are beheaded. We see the following written. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The word provides us more understanding of what follows once the number under the altar reached completion, or once the first resurrection's gleanings are fully completed. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? 
Luke points out the fact that once those under the altar have reached their full number, requiring 42 months and positioned in the first half of the tribulation, the Lord avenges their blood on those who dwell on the earth, and when he returns there would seem to be no faith found on the earth. Now we know that those with the mark of the beast would not be eligible for salvation, and they have exchanged being created in the image of God for the image of the beast in their bodies, and this would point to a similar situation that existed in the time of Noah. The Bible tells us that in Noah's days fallen angels procreated with humanity and produced an offspring that was known as the Nephilim, which is a mixture between the DNA of humanity and that of fallen angels. We see this also described to us in Daniel 2 verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. Keep the second part of this passage in mind, as it is important to consider in relation to what else is said about this point in time. The only other group that would exist on earth at this time would be the remnant of Israel, who at this point would be fleeing into the wilderness, and the word of God tells us that they are a people in whom there is no faith. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. So what does this tell us about the Lord's return? If the gleanings of the faith harvest are required to be completed before Israel's blindness can be removed, this has to happen during the first half of the tribulation. That means that the main harvest, which represents the wise virgins, the good servants, the church of Philadelphia, those who are shining their lights in the world and who have received the keys of David are kept from the hour that follows as soon as they are removed. The main harvest of this crop therefore results in the tribulation breaking out over the world and the gleanings commencing directly following this event. This process continues then for 42 months until the last Gentile who refuses the mark of the beast is beheaded followed by the two witnesses who would lay down their lives willingly to fulfill Revelation 6 verse 11. This would mark the fullness of the Gentiles and Israel's blindness being removed. This would also imply that Jesus will be returning at the midpoint of the tribulation in order for Israel to see him with their eyes, in order to recognize who he is, and for the model given to us in Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace to match Jesus being in the furnace with Israel. If Jesus only returned at the end of the tribulation, Israel would not be given the opportunity to recognize him by laying their eyes on him. If they received protection in the wilderness without seeing their Messiah, they will not be in a position to recognize their offense and may give the glory for their protection to the false Messiah. There are several other passages that point to events that coincide with the midpoint of the tribulation, associated with a massive earthquake that splits the earth open. When the two witnesses are beheaded, the fullness of the Gentiles would have been achieved. Israel, who would be fleeing into the wilderness as per Matthew 24 at this point, would be allowed three and a half days journey away from Judea when the following events will occur, all coinciding with this massive earthquake. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Revelation 11 describes the hour in which the two witnesses are resurrected. Jesus mentions the same event in Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, 
whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Gabriel also informs Daniel what will happen to Jerusalem and the temple at this point. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Here we see a flood that is associated with the flight of the remnant from which they will also be saved, and the same is mentioned to us in Revelation 12. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The earth opening up, which is associated with an earthquake and a flood that is swallowed up, would point to a massive geological event that will occur and from which the remnant will receive protection as they are fleeing. This imagery is once again repeated in the book of Zechariah. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass, that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. When Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, the first fruits of the next harvest is seen with him, showing us that the resurrection of the gleanings of the barley harvest and the first fruits of the wheat harvest happen very close together. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Jesus' return to the earth is associated with the remnant of Israel fleeing at the time 
a massive earthquake that will split the Mount of Olives in two and destroying the Antichrist, the Temple and Jerusalem in the process. This is when Jesus begins his judgment over those who have the mark of the beast and who killed his servants that have been crying out to him for 42 months to avenge their blood. This judgment continues into the second half of the tribulation. When Jesus returns, the remnant will not only see him, but they will also see the first fruits of the wheat harvest that will be resurrected at the time of his return, while the remnant of Israel represents the main section of the wheat harvest that will repopulate the new earth in the millennium. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So to recap for today, with everything considered and focusing on avoiding contradiction between passages, we can see that Paul's resurrection event, which clearly differs from that which is described by John in Revelation, would seem to interrupt normal life as we know it today. It is clearly positioned at the start of the tribulation. Forty-two months later, after the outer court of the temple have been trampled underfoot, there is another resurrection event that coincides with the two witnesses being resurrected, and including those who were beheaded for refusing to worship the Antichrist. This coincides with the return of Jesus to the earth to reveal his identity to Israel and to have them enter their protection in the wilderness during a time that will follow, in which life in a mortal body on the earth would be impossible without God's protection. The second half of the tribulation will therefore have shortened days of only 16 hours as per Revelation 8. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. One last point that I would like to make before we close this video off is addressing the question of who is the Bride of Christ. In Revelation 19 we read the following. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. To understand this, we have to consider what the word of God says about a marriage between a man and a woman. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. We have also seen that when Jesus spoke about his body, he associated it with the temple. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. We know that the bride will become one flesh with Jesus, who refers to a three-part body, and as such we can understand that the barley harvest in its entirety would be required to meet those specifications. Having the twenty-four elders already resurrected and occupying thrones in the most holy place of God's temple, those who will be taken out of the world before the start of the tribulation, representing the main harvest and holy place of God's temple, and having the indwelling Holy Spirit in them, and finally also those who are beheaded during the tribulation for refusing to worship the Antichrist and remaining faithful unto death, we have a three-part body of the bride that will become one with the three-part temple of God in the marriage that will follow. Although all three parts will have different attributes, they are all holy to the Lord and will serve a specific function in the body of Christ once the marriage has taken place. If you have found that this video was helpful in providing understanding of what is written to us in the Word of God, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel so you can follow upcoming videos when they are uploaded. Also please help me by sharing this with others so that more can receive understanding of God's Word. 
you'll see that the current interest in these videos are very low so it is concerning that people are not really interested in seeing what the word of god really says if there are any questions or aspects that are still a little unclear please post your questions and comments in the comment section below and i will either answer you in that section or follow up with another video in which i will try to address those questions if time allows i have also provided links to the scripts for these videos that you are welcome to download if you would like to study this for yourself and you are welcome to share these with others and use them to translate the videos into other languages if you want to we never know what will happen after the rapture but if you would like to make copies of this information and to share this with those who will remain behind you are more than welcome to do so may god bless you and keep you and may his grace accompany you wherever you go until next time god bless